So hello everyone. In, this would be the Insta lecture number 86 and we'll be going to discuss about the a very key concept on the glomerular disorders, key topic of glomerular disorder that is membranous nephropathy. And we'll deal with the key concepts of the membranous nephropathy. So today uh, in the pathology 360, I've given a case study. The case study reads like this, a 36 year old insurance executive comes to you with complaints of foamy urine. Physical examination reveals generalized edema. Urine analysis reveal non-selective proteinuria. Non-selective proteinuria means not only the low molecular weight proteins like albumins are getting leaked by the kidney, but also the larger molecular weight proteins, they could be leaked out. They are leaked out. And also there's a presence of fatty casts, but no RBCs, no RBC, WBC cast. Even protein is 4.3 gram per 24 hours, which is more than the cutoff limit to be called as nephrotic quench proteinuria because that should be more than 3.5 gram per 24 hours. Renal biopsy shows diffuse thickening of the capillary wall and spike and dome pattern, and electron microscope reveals sub-epithelial immune complex deposits along the glomerular basement membrane, sub-epithelial deposition. Which one of the following is the most likely diagnosis? So they are given four options, membranous nephropathy, minimal chain disease, focal segmented glomerular sclerosis, and MPGN, membranous proliferative glomerular nephritis. All four of them, they are known cause of nephritic syndrome. So how to deal with this kind of cases? So to understand that, we'll start with uh, a series of discussion on nephrotic syndrome. And this will be the first on this series, which I'm going to discuss on membranous nephropathy. If you uh, go through this lecture, this series of Insta lectures, I, I hope it will be very easy and take work for you to, to crack this kind of case studies or questions or to understand or interpret or analyze and diagnose this kind of cases. So what will be the learning objective in this session is particularly dedicated for membranous nephropathy. We will try to understand what is membranous nephropathy, to define membranous nephropathy, what does the name implies membranous nephropathy. The name actually speaks for itself, the glomerular disorders. We will try to understand the hidden meaning of these two words, membranous nephropathy. How does the patients of membranous nephropathy present? Usually this is seen in adults. It's a common known cause of, well-known cause and common cause, particularly in the Caucasian males. Uh, of nephrotic syndrome in the age group of 30 to 60. We try to understand the etiology, pathogenesis, and classification, the primary and secondary of the cause of the nephrotic syndrome. And there's a new hot topic that is called NIL1 associated membranous nephropathy. We try to understand what is all about this NIL1 associated MN. And then we'll be dealing with the diagnostic features, the morphological features. You know that glomerular disorders are basically three step diagnosis. There are Firstly, the light microscopic diagnosis with the usual routine hematoxylin, eosin stain, PS stain, or silver stains. Second, we require some cases, the immunofluorescence. Basically, a lot of diseases are diagnosed on the basis of immunofluorescence. For example, IgN nephropathy. You can diagnose IgN nephropathy only on immunofluorescence by detecting the deposition of IgA on the mesangium. Because IgA or IgM, that cannot be figured out on the light microscope. It's very simple to understand. So you require immunofluorescence to detect what's actually getting deposited in the immune complex. And lastly, we review the case study which you have given and try to figure it out that why that's a case of membranous nephropathy. So let's proceed. First thing is this, what is membranous nephropathy? This is a very big concept to understand. And as I mentioned earlier, the name actually tells a lot about this disease. The name is made with two words, membranous and nephropathy. And the name, the term membranous, initially at the beginning, is basically is talking about glomerular basement membrane. So glomerular basement membrane is, in this case, it will become diffusely thickened. And that those primary histologic changes are actually seen on the renal biopsy only. So that's a very key diagnostic point that you need to understand. But there is another disorder which is called membranoproliferative nephritis, known nephritis, and BGN. So that, that there is also membranous changes and proliferative changes. These proliferative changes are not there in this disease. So there are no or little cellular proliferation or infiltrative changes which you can see in the glomerular nephritis. That's very important. So the term membranous nephropathy actually speaks that this is a disease which is associated with glomerular basement membrane changes, which is leading to nephropathy. In particular, which change is seen, that is membranous 
thickening, diffuse capillary basement membrane thickening. Now, this is characterized by sub epithelial immunoglobulin continent deposits along the glomerular basement membrane. If you try to read and understand, and when we actually diagnose also, these diseases, in particular, the electron microscopy, they're diagnosed by glomerular disorders by their location of the deposition. Some are sub epithelial, like membranous is sub epithelial deposition. In membranous proliferative glomerular nephritis, you can see sub endothelial location. In lupus nephritis, you can also see sub endothelial location. So, you need to understand that what is the meaning of this term, sub-epithelial location, sub-endothelial location. So in this hand-drawn diagram of mine, actually you can see that in this case, the location of the deposits are sub-epithelial. Now, this is a photocyte. This cell is a photocyte. This is the glomerular capillary. And this one is a basement membrane. So if the immune complex deposits are getting deposited beneath the capillary, endothelial cell, then this is called subendothelial. If it is getting deposited beneath the photocyte food process, these are the photocytes. This is the photocyte, this is the photocyte, this is the photocyte. Now this red, red things which I have drawn actually, actually they look blackish, but I have drawn is red, reddish to make it easily appreciable. So these things actually, they're getting deposited beneath the food process of photocytes which is also known as visceral epithelial cell. So that's why the term sub-epithelial. I hope it is clear right now. That's why it is called sub-epithelial deposition. So any glomerular disorder, there is a three-step approach actually. We've either diagnosed by light microscope evolution or by immunofluorescence, followed by immunofluorescence and often we require electron microscopy. Here I'd like to clarify one point that many people think Due to probably due to the lack of exposure in the field of renal pathology, that think the electron microscopy is only required for research. That's not at all. Electron microscopy is very much required for diagnosis of glomerular disorders, particularly. A lot of glomerular disorders diagnosis that depend on the electron microscopy finding. It's a place where there is a requirement for use in the particular particular in the tertiary setup. There is presence of electron microscopy, like in Insteli, where I have also done earlier study on this this field of renal pathology with the electron microscope. So uh, it's a most frequent clinical manifestation is obviously nephrotic syndrome. Uh, this is the typical feature which you see in a patient of uh, minimal chain disease. And typically this is seen in the age group of 30 to 60 years. Now there are other primary cause of nephrotic syndrome. Nephrotic syndrome is a constellation of the clinical syndrome with constellation of features. The patient usually have massive proteinuria. The patient usually have hyperalbuminemia. The patient usually have edema, generalized edema, and a circa. They have hyperlipidemia and lipiduria. So all these features when are seen together, particularly the presence of massive proteinuria is the key. We call that patient is having nephrotic syndrome. And more than 3.5 grams per 24 hours. That is the cutoff limit. Actually, you should have more than that. Now there are a lot of some causes are actually confined in the kidney, and some could be secondary due to a systemic disease, like nephrotic syndrome could be systemic diseases, like could be due to systemic diseases like diabetes mellitus, SLE, amyloidosis. And there are certain diseases which are actually primary diseases which are leading to the development of the nephrotic syndrome. The diseases are key ones are minimal change disease, which is the most common cause of nephrotic syndrome in children. Focal segmented tumorosclerosis is a key cause in the adults particularly in many part of the world, this is the most common cause in the adults right now. Membrane of proliferative glomerular nephritis and IgA nephropathy. These are the key diseases which are there, which can cause nephrotic syndrome. I would be dealing each of them in a different insta lecture right now through this PowerPoint. This one is on, particularly on the membranous nephropathy. Now, membranous nephropathy usually presents in the adults between the ages of 30 and 60 years. And if you see in a young female membranous nephropathy, please, please rule out the possibility of lupus nephritis because it could be caused secondarily due to lupus. And lupus is one of the secondary causes of, SL is one of the secondary causes of membranous nephropathy. The typical age group is 30 to 40, more often, uh, more than 40 plus, particularly in the Caucasian males. It usually follows a slowly progressive course. And the patient usually presents with the features of the nephrotic syndrome with massive proteinuria. There are 
two groups there. One is primary, up to 80 to 85 percent cases, approximately the primary, that is three fourths to four fifths, and other 20 percent cases roughly could be due to secondary cause. It could be due to infections like hepatitis, cystosomiasis, malaria. It could be due to drugs like penicillin, gold, captopril. It could be like cancers like melanoma, lung cancers, breast cancer, autoimmune diseases like SLE. These are these diseases. If they cause membranous nephropathy, we call it secondary membranous nephropathy. Now, primary membranous nephropathy is one term right now. It's very hot topic. NIL1 associated membranous nephropathy. Now, primary membranous nephropathy, the well-known one is already, I hope you know, that there's antibodies against M-type, podocyte, antigen, phospholipid, A2 receptor. These are frequently seen in this patient. Now, they're not confirmed as positive. But there are other antigens also, other than phospholipid receptor, they could be contributing to the development of the membranous nephropathy. One recent one that which has been found is NIL1, which is called, stands for Neural Epidermal Growth Factor Like 1 protein. So in PLR2 negative cases, approximately 16% of them, this could be positive in the patient. Another one is important one is thrombospondin type 1 domain containing 7 n This is another antigen which is implicated in the pastenosis of membranous nephropathy. Particularly, they are important for the cancer-associated secondary membranous nephropathy. Neutral endopeptide is also another one which has been implicated in the pastenosis. This I already mentioned that these are not only phospholipid A2 receptor, but other antigens are also implicated in the pathogenesis. Now, basically what happens is that immune de deposition occurs on the subepithelial region, which I already mentioned. It leads to complement activation on the surface of protocytes, and that generates the membrane attack complex, MSC, which in turn leads to the damage to the protocyte, leading to the protein urea. And protein urea, is, in case of membranous nephropathy, is typically non cft Morphological features, I quickly briefly review them. There are three steps already mentioned, light microscopic, immunofluorescence, and electron microscopic. On light microscopy, you see the diffuse thickening of the capillary wall. If you see this thing that the capillary walls are very much thickened, it looks like some a kid with H2B pencil has actually thickened this basement membrane like that. If you compare this with a normal glomerular basement membrane capillary loops, you can easily understand the difference. It's quite thick actually. Why the thickening of capillary wall occurs is due to the subepithelial deposits, which is seen in electron microscope. Now, subepithelial deposits occur on the top of glomerular basement membrane, which creates a small spike-like protrusion of the glomerular basement membrane. So this creates a spike and dome pattern. It requires some specific time to explain. I will try to explain in a separate video. Now, these spikes are quite seen, actually. You can see this thing. They are seen very well in the silver stem. And immunal fluorescence also you see diffuse glomerular pattern, particularly containing IgG and the complements, deposits which are getting deposited over the basement membrane below the protocyte food process. So this image actually tells you a lot to clear your concept. This is the protocyte food process, and this is the basement membrane, and this is the endothelium penetration. So they are getting deposited sub-epithelial, sub-epithelial location. This is quite characteristic for membranous nephropathy. In this case also you can see, these are the sub-epithelial location of the deposits. And this is endothelial cell. This, this is the glomerular filtration barrier actually. This I already explained through this hand drawing diagram. So right now I hope it is going to be very clear to all of you that this is a typical case of membranous nephropathy because the patient is presenting with a Nephrotic syndrome like feature in the adult with a non selective proteinuria, there is a spike and dome pattern, diffuse thickening of the capillary one subepithelial immune complex. So, obviously, the diagnosis would be straightforward one, membranous nephropathy. So, that's all for this case session. Thank you very much for joining this session. Really appreciate it.